So hello and welcome to my garage. Right, like a lot of people, I'm stuck in lockdown. So save me from climbing the walls. I wanted a little project to do. And I thought, what better than to tackle Wardle Bay, the magazine's 009 gauge exhibition layout. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Wardle Bay, it's a very compact layout. The original idea was it's a layout that you could put in a spare room or on a shelf and uh, sort of not interrupt the family home too much. So what does it feature? Well, so the idea is it's a single track railway, similar to the Festiniog, which comes into a station and then uh, it branches out. So you've got the bay platform at the back, and then you've got the main platform bang in the middle with the run round loop. So a, tra a passenger train could come in and then uh, the engine could run round and take passengers back. You've also got a engine shed with water tower and a couple of bay platforms for a bit of freight. Currently the layout is DCC operated. A lot of the locomotives ha are sound fitted as well with stair lives. Um, there are no point motors and some of the lights don't work, although there is scope to add that later on in the future. Off scene, we have a three yard fiddle yard just behind me. And that's, I suppose, at an exhibition or I suppose in a smaller space, it's a good place to store your trains um, so you can swap them around and add a bit of interest to the uh, rolling stock coming in and out of the scene. So I know what you're thinking. It's a relatively complete layout. What am I possibly going to do to fill my time with it? Well, I thought I'd route round my bits boxes and wood pile and see if I can't add another four foot section to this layout. Nothing too difficult, but I did fancy having a bit of scenery and trying to really capture the sort of the Welsh mountains, similar to that of the Festiniog, and uh, basically give the train somewhere to go so I've got a bit more uh, room to play with them. <laughs> Very simple. But as you'd imagine, it's quite cold in this garage, so first things first, I'm gonna get the kettle on and then we'll get on and I'll show you what I've done. Tony's Trains of Rugby is located at Hillmorton Locks on the outskirts of Rugby. We are open Tuesday to Saturday 10 till 5 but closing early on Saturday at 4 o'clock. We stock Hornby Backman, Graham Farish, Pico, Gage Master, Haljan, Oxford and Oxford Diecast, Cure Scale and more. We also have a large selection of second hand models to suit all budgets. You can either visit us in store or reach me on 01788 543 442, visit our website tonystrainsofrugby.com or find us on Facebook. How's that for a good cup of tea? Right, so from left to right, you can see I have found, dug out some Woodland Scenics fine and medium ballast, both of which are grey blend. I have various fine turfs. I have greens and earth colours, so they will go um, underneath pretty much everything. Um, then I have various coarse turfs um, with light green and olive green. I have some Gage Master plaster bandage now. Um, I'm going to try something a bit different um, this time around. Now, <clears throat> you will see the words no nonsense here. I'm going to uh, have some fun, a bit of messy modelling, um, with this expanding foam. And I'm going to use that to form the base of any sort of hillsides I create on the new bit of layout. Then, of course, I have my trusty WWS basing glue and layering spray for all the grasses and of course their Prograss uh, macro, micro applicator. My various track laying tools, a um, bit of track magic for the current one. Now onto here we have some wills kits. I've got a uh, river slash canal bridge um, which I'm, I'm going to try and incorporate if I can add some height to the next part. An occupational bridge and a culvert as well and of course here you can see the Gage Master Prodigy Advance. Um, a pencil, trusty pencil, and a trusty DCC Concepts track rubber. These are massive, but they're the best thing since sliced bread. 
well recommended. Right, quick swig of my uh, brew, and then I'll show you uh, the new part of the layout. So you can see what effect a good cup of tea has on me. And here we are. So this is the new four foot scenic section. So just to give you a brief rundown of how it's constructed, it is completely made from scrap I've had laying around from the building of my uh, bigger double O gauge model railway. So the uh, front face, as you see, the base itself is uh, off cuts from the main baseboard on my layout. Um, the back scene here is, um, as you'd imagine, a back scene uh, cut off, um, and it actually still has some back scene stuck to the back of it. So <laughs> really authentic. The legs underneath, two before timber, uh, scraps and uh, roughly put together on some adjustable feet. I mentioned the adjustable feet, that's the only part I've had to buy an order in. Um, and it was £10 for eight of them. So what we've got, as I said, another four foot section. Um, and the main difference with this one is I'm going to set it lower than the first section. And this is because I want to have raised scenery. So just to get a grasp of the height difference, the track bed on Wardle Bay is ground level, flat. I want the track level on this scenic section to be, it's probably just about there on the bridge. So you can see it's gonna be a couple of inches lower, um, but I think that'll add some nice scenic vistas to this layout. So first things first, now this is constructed, I'm gonna paint the base, paint the fascia, paint the back scene, nice bit of gray, nice bit of blue. And there, uh, it starts to look really tidy. So as before, here is the paint. Same again, just what's left over in the garage. Now this one is some Wix Wall and Ceilings Smooth Finish number 235, um, which is slate gray in a matte color. Moving on to the, uh, the Sky, uh, same brand, number 910 Sky Matte, if you're following along. And the reason we do this at this stage is uh, twofold. One is to seal in the wood and just protect it. I mean, it's in this garage, so it's gonna be pretty damp, particularly over winter. And the other one is it looks nice. Simple as that. So let's get on. And there we go. Now, I have been a bit brave because I have painted two colours at the same time. Now, you can probably see there are certain areas, like here, where I've not dared go too close um, for fear of mixing the paint while, it's both, while both colours are wet. So what I'll do is I'll let this first coat dry and then uh, I'll give each a second coat, um, should they need it. And then uh, I'll touch up those gaps as we go. But I think you'll agree. It's looking rather good and it's at that stage now where I just want to get building some trains and um, I think by painting it, it just finishes off the woodwork nicely and uh, gives you that picture box to suddenly start creating your scene. So, so what I'm going to do now is go away, let this paint dry overnight as it is a bit damp in here. Um, it'll probably need all night to dry. However, that gives me a good opportunity to reminisce about some of the things I saw when I visited the Festiniog Highland Railway. And I'm gonna try and pick out some of the points, some of the things that stuck with me most, and try and see what we can put into this four foot section to try and recapture that railway, or that kind of railway, in this scene. So um, I'm gonna leave you with some footage um, to hopefully we'll get a gist of what I'm trying to, trying to do. Either way, it's all good fun and I'm desperate for it to be tomorrow. So, after this, you'll see him in a minute.
So here we are at Boston Lodge, which is the main shed for the Festinio Railway in Northern Wales. And once again, I'm joined by Tony French, who seems to be here more and more. We seem to be going everywhere, where it includes to live steam, real steam. Can't get rid of it, can you? No, <laughs> as much as we try. <laughs> so, why are we here, Tony? We're here because what better place in the Festinio Railway to learn all about narrow gauge? It's one of the oldest narrow gauge railways in the world and the oldest railway operating company in the world too. Linda is just behind the camera being prepared for service, so I think we should head up to Port Maddock Harbour Station to catch our train. Right, let's go and see what there is to see. Let's do that. Right, so we've made our train. We're now sat in a lovely compartment. The burning question people will have at home will be wondering, what is narrow gauge? So put basically, Richard, narrow gauge is narrower. Um, in Britain, we run to standard gauge, which is four foot eight and a half inches. Not the same all around the world. Um, places like Ireland and India have got uh, wider gauges. Uh, but yeah, narrow gauge is narrower. The one we're on today, Festin Yog, is one foot 11 and a half inches often referred to as two foot, um, places like Linton and Barstable are also one foot eleven and a half, and then other lines, Talaflin is slightly bigger, two foot three, and the Welsh Corn Flamboy is two foot six, and bigger, even bigger, um, places like the Isle of Man Railway, which is three foot gauge, which is probably the biggest narrow gauge you get, but it's, there's no standard with narrow gauge, it's all sorts of things, but yeah, put simply, narrower. Reasons for this is because um, it's a lot cheaper to build a narrow gauge railway railway than a, a standard gauge one, you know, the, the rails are cheaper and things like that because it's lighter weight rail. And with this line we're on state of Festin, you know, when we climb up into the hills, it's kind of on a shelf and of course for a narrow gauge it's the shelf is narrower as well, so it's a lot cheaper to cut away and um, blast into the landscape. Um, also one of the other advantages in narrow gauge is it, it climbs, it, you can climb and go around tighter corners a lot easier than you can with standard gauge, so it's in this terrain, the North Wales Hills, and you know, it's a lot more easier for it to get up and down and go around tight bends. You'll, you'll see later on in the videos that we switch back on ourselves a lot and things like that, which with a standard gauge engine, you need a lot of space and distance to get around those kind of corners where a narrow gauge engine will go around, not quite on a sixpence, but a lot tighter curves. I realise I've used the word narrow a lot, but you know, that really emphasises the difference, doesn't it? So we've well and truly departed Harbour Station. I want to know what we can expect on the first leg of our journey. And I think the best place to start is the Cobb, which is this giant, well, it looks like a dam. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was originally. It was actually built long before the railway, about what, 20 years before the railway. Um, 1809 to 1811 it was constructed and it was for land reclamation, uh, basically to stop the, the tide coming in so far and to give more land for farming. And then uh, when the, I mean the locals used to use it anyway as a walkway, roadway, but obviously when the Festivio Railway came along in 1830, 
it went straight across into the harbour. It's a nice convenient use of road, rail and walkway. It is, it? yeah. yeah. Um, when it first came along and the railway first was built, there was a bit of problem because the railway went basically straight on where the original road was, so there'd be people walking along and there'd be horses and carts going along and also slate wagons coming along. So after a while the cup was modified so there was a clear distinction between what was roadway and what was railway to avoid any accidents. And of course at the end of the cop is Boston Lodge Works, where we started our journey this morning. That's right, yeah. Boston Lodge Works originally was where the, the guys who built the cob, uh, well, resided and, you know, stayed and did various bits of work. And it, the reason it's called Boston Lodge is William Maddox, who was the the brains and the finance behind the cob, was the, the Member of Parliament for Boston in Lincolnshire, which is where Boston Lodge comes from. Um, and then, of course, again, when the railway turned up, these buildings were there, so they were adapted for, for use in the railway as uh, the railways works, where a lot of locomotives were actually built at Boston Lodge for the Festive York Railway. The double fairlers were built at Boston Lodge, and the replica engines, a lot of them had been built at Boston Lodge, as well as being the home for maintenance and servicing. As time's gone on, Boston Lodge has turned into a very big development with carriage sheds and various other buildings being added. And it seems to, every time I come, it seems to get bigger and bigger. So you could say it's like a working heart of the realm? Oh, absolutely. Without Boston Lodge, the festival would be a very different place. <laughs> so as we pass Boston Lodge, we're curving sharply round to the left, where we run briefly alongside the main road, uh, through Boston Lodge Holt, and then we go under the main road and on towards Minford. It's all very fascinating stuff. However, I'm sure the viewers are desperate to see some more progress on the Wardle Bay expansion. So for the time being, We'll enjoy the rest of the trip. However, they will nip back to the workshop. Fear not, we'll be back to check in on our trip later in the show. Back to the studio. I'm Alex Yates and this is the Model Centre. We sell absolutely everything you can imagine in, in the popular scales. We've got our customisation services, so you've got weathering, got renaming and renumbering, and then all the sort of add-ons, so like real coal, we can fit the parts pack for you, nameplates, cab crew, everything like that. You can order online or on the phone, come and collect it from us, or you can come to the door and we'll just serve you from there. And we're doing free postage on the website as well to, to sort of compensate for the fact that the shop's not open. So you can visit us on our website, themodelcentre.com. Our phone number is 01947 899 125. And here we are. So. We're at the next day, um, an instant for you. The paint is touch dry, as you can see, luckily. Um, so all that's left for me to do now is to manoeuvre this board out of the way um, and detach the fiddle yard, the off scene section, currently on Wardle Bay behind me, and uh, basically stick it onto this end. So, oh, let's get to juggling around in this uh, very full garage. And there we go, just like that, we're now in position. So I suppose one of the advantages to these smaller modular layouts um, with a gauge such as 009 or even something like N-Gage is you can maneuver the modular sections quite easily as I've done. But on first glance, it may look all right. However, under closer inspection, there may be some fettling required and isn't fettling a good word for this hobby because we do a lot of it. So come in closer 
and I'll show you some of the things that I need to do. So now we've moved in close, so this is probably the best angle to look at all the issues. So, if you remember me saying I wanted a bit more landscape to this second module, so I wanted the baseboard here to be lower. Now the Wills Bridge and River Canal uh, side, as you can see, is quite a bit higher than the track. So that means that this baseboard has to go down somewhat. So the first issue we can see, now the top here, they're as good as level. This fascia currently matches the first one, I'm happy with that. However, it's not permanent, we can move that. So if the baseboards go down and it becomes unlevel up here, that's not such a problem. I'm hoping the back drops, if my math is correct, once this baseboard gets adjusted down, the back scenes will match and things like this bridge will fit the height of the track there in the corner. So the first bit of fettling is with the adjustable feet, which hopefully will prove invaluable. So I think I've done enough fettling of these boards. There is a more permanent solution coming where I can join them here and here, um, but they haven't arrived yet. Um, I did say I was gonna use scrap from around the garage to build this, but um, the odd purchase may have crept in, um, but I'll show you that when they arrive. So after playing with my spirit level for far too long, I think we're about there and I'm really chuffed with the backgrounds have now aligned in height and this bridge is the perfect level for the track bed. So I'm very relieved at that. So now we've got a solid base. Onto the fun bit, I have some code 80 009 gauge track, flexi track of course, and I'm gonna attach it here and just have a play. And I'm gonna use a trusty pencil to sketch out the, uh, the rough route of the trains um, before building the embankment. So oh, this should be quite a fun bit, so I'm, I'm gonna get on. So as you've seen, a very simple process, just using the pencil, just to lightly template roughly around where the track's gonna go. I could have just had a straight piece of track here, but I wanted to add a couple of potential vistas and maybe a bit of scenic interest, if you can do that with a single piece of track, um, just by adding a light snake to the, uh, the section of track there. Obviously, as you've just seen, I've then gone outside and found a scrap piece of polystyrene, which, <laughs> You can tell it's been outside because it's got a lovely, a lovely hue of green to it. Some would say it's natural modelling, but I would probably say it's just being left outside for a bit. This is purely down here to su support the track once it's stuck in. This isn't the final landscape, obviously. So next on the jobs list, um, I'm going to assemble the plastic kits. So all my Wills kits, I'm now going to assemble um, and then roughly put them in position. Once I know where they're going to go, I'm then going to PVA down uh, these polystyrene blocks so they're solid. So once the polystyrene is stuck down overnight and becomes my sort of foundation for the track, then comes the real fun. I know a lot of you are probably thinking I'm having far too much fun messy modeling already with this polystyrene, making a bit of a snowstorm here in my garage. However, the fun really starts when we come to play with this no-nonsense expanding foam. So for the sake of uh, a five or a ten or whatever this bottle was at the time, um, I will fill in all the gaps it will raise overnight and then it'll go solid and I'll be able to hack it down and make all of this look like some, um, some kind of landscape, fingers crossed. So that's the next stage. I want to get on and uh, ooh, I'm quite excited.
Right, so as expected, a couple of days later, the expanding foam has expanded. So it's done exactly what it says on the tin. And believe it or not, it's actually quite solid. So it's gone from that sort of uh, goopy spray to something rather useful. You could uh, sculpt on that pretty much straight away. Although this isn't very realistic. So what we're gonna do, I'm going to use this, this knife just to sort of carve the scene down into something a bit more realistic. Um, you could use a very cheap um, hot wire cutter as well. They can be very useful, particularly if your railway or scene is larger. As this is only small, um, this will do. So I'm gonna get on with that and try and make this look a bit more realistic. As I said, you could cut this down and then use this as the base to your scenery. However, I'm gonna go one step further and once it's cut down, I'm gonna cover it in plaster. In this instance, sculptor mock plaster and then uh, hopefully we'll get something looking really realistic. So, let's get to cutting. Yes, welcome to this week's Model Railway News. You can, of course, keep up to date on the latest happenings at Hornby Magazine's website at keymodelworld.com. So to business, and Hornby's received the first EP sample of its newly tooled double O gauge BR Mark IV driving van trailer for checking over, as well as its first example of the new BR Mark IV buffet car too. Four liveries are planned in BR Intercity, GNER, LNER and Transport for Wales colours with accurate detailing for the period modelled. The Mark IV buffet car will be available in original first class and later modified standard class form too. Meanwhile, the manufacturer has also updated progress on its all-new 00 gauge BR Standard 9F, sharing development drawings of the forthcoming model. Currently at the early CAD drawing stage, three models are due to appear as 92167 in BR Black with early crests, 92194 in BR Black with late crests, and the National Collection's 92220 Evening Star in BR Lined Green with late crests. Incidentally, the tooling suite will enable most variants of the 251 9Fs to be produced, with differences such as single and double chimneys, while five new tenders are also being developed, with BR1B, BR1C, BR1F, BR1G and BR1K examples being tooled. Now next, Hornby's 00 gauge Maunsell Gangway bogey luggage vans will be in the shops very soon, with production samples of the vans having arrived with the development team for evaluation. Five vehicles are due to appear this year, with two in Southern Railway Olive Green, two in BR Crimson and one in Pullman Umber and Cream, as Sir Winston Churchill's funeral hearse. Prices are set at $36.99 each for the standard liveries and $40.99 for the Pullman liveried example. 
A Curascal has received decorated samples of its new 00 gauge 21 tonne steel mineral open wagons for assessment. First announced in November last year, these newly tooled models will cover unfitted and vacuum braked examples in BR grey and BR bauxite. As we've come to expect, there'll be plenty of detailing too with differences between the two types. Offered in triple wagon packs, they're priced at $74.95 per pack. Five sets in each color scheme form the initial releases with a mix of pre-tops and tops examples. Production is expected to get underway shortly. Tying in neatly with this, Rails of Sheffield has commissioned a triple pack of the 21-ton mineral opens in MC Metals branded grey, as used on scrap metal traffic to Ravenscraig Steelworks and has taken delivery of a decorated sample of one of the wagons for checking over. Now this leads rather nicely onto decorated samples of the newly tooled BR21 ton Coil A steel carriers, which have also arrived for assessment by Curascal's development team. This model was launched back in January as an extension of the 21 ton steel mineral open wagon project, from which it shares a common underframe. Three triple packs of wagons are planned, two pre-tops and one tops, each containing individually numbered wagons in BR bauxite. Now the specification includes oleo buffers, a wealth of separately applied detailing parts, separate canvas hood and more. Priced at $74.95 per triple pack, delivery is still on track for later this year. Now Cav Alex Models has confirmed that a second run of its 00 gauge BBA bogey steel carriers will follow later this year. Previous examples of the company's BBA and BLA steel wagons sold through very quickly on arrival in the UK last year. This next batch of 00 gauge BBAs will include examples in BR Bauxite, Ralph Freight Red and Black, EWS Maroon and Plain Brown, while the BLA variant will be produced in BR Ralph Freight Red and Black, EWS Maroon and Plain Brown. Running numbers have yet to be decided. Allied to this, the common BBA chassis tooling will also enable the manufacturer to develop further variants of this particular wagon for 2022, including covered BIA, BWA and BXA variants, while BZA conversions with steel coil cradles are also planned. Prices have yet to be confirmed, but the BBA and BLA wagons are expected during July, August later this year. And finally, Display Models has added a new 4mm scale pack of assorted skips to its growing collection of model building kits and detailing accessories. This latest addition is a multimedia kit which builds into four 4mm scale skips using a mix of MDF and 0.4mm ply parts to complete four different types of skip. Priced at £18 plus postage and packing, it's available now from Display Models. And a gentle reminder that you can follow all the latest news stories at keymodelworld.com with stories appearing as they happen. You can also read the latest issue of Hornby Magazine online too. Plus, bonus video content to come this week includes a Fowler 7F sound demonstration to tie in nicely with our Somerset and Dorset themed issue. A Class 68 sound demonstration showcasing Digitrain's latest in-house sound project for the class. And you can also watch Hatton's new O-Gage Gresley Corridor coaches in action on Hornby Magazine's office test track, plus much more too. That's all at keymodelworld.com. Bye for now. My name's James Smith. Uh, and I'm the owner of yeah, Smith's Model Railways. Based in uh, Sheringham in Norfolk, uh, just on the main high street. Really, really close to the North Norfolk Railway. So we stock from N-Gage to O-Gage. Brands like Pico, Graham Farish, uh, Hornby, Batman. Just launched uh, our new loyalty card uh, just after uh, lockdown when we reopened. So we also offer these uh, gift vouchers. You can either contact us via our telephone, uh, email or with our contact form on our website. So now here comes the fun part, which is the sculptor mould. Now, you can probably just see behind me, I've been playing with some of the Hornby walls and the positioning of the wheels, kits, etc. Um, 
And as I said earlier, you could use this as a base for scenery. However, I'm going to show you now a next step, a cheap next step, and uh, hopefully it will give you some vast improvement, some smoothing out of your scenery when you're doing your own modelling. So moving on to Sculptor Mold. What is Sculptor Mold? Well, you can buy it in these bags. They are £3 in weight and roughly £10 uh, in price. It has the consistency of crushed toilet paper. You can put that down. You can probably just see I have some ready prepared and it's sort of, it feels like shredded loo roll. Um, it's very odd. It's meant to have the consistency when working, uh, when mixed with water of clay but then has the uh, hardened properties of plaster. So very good for modeling landscapes. So time to get on with the real modeling now. Uh, if you do like messy modeling, you are absolutely gonna love this stage of modeling. I do, um, because as you'll see, you're gonna get very messy. So to mix Sculptor Mold, you need a container and then equal parts of the Sculptor Mold itself and water. I will add that uh, I'm filming this and it's currently snowing outside and because of the microphones I've had to turn off my heaters so um, <laughs> this water, ooh, freezing, things to do. So first things first I'm going to pour this rough bowl of Sculptor Mold in, I'm going to leave a bit of excess in, in my tub just in case, you can see nice and dusty and then I'm going to get on with the fun bit which is adding the water. So. Uh, here goes. And I wish I could say it was as simple as that, but no. You can see I've rolled my sleeves up, so it's time to get on with the fun bit. And we've got to mix it in. Now you could do this with a, a utensil, but I find the best way is to get your hands in there. And yes, I can confirm, this is absolutely freezing. <laughs> Serves me right for modeling in my garage. So just before the fun part, I'm just making sure there's no loose bits of polystyrene anywhere. Um, there's always gonna be some left over. Um, however, the cleaner you can get it, the better at this stage. Now, I've not glued in any of the, uh, the uh, bridges or the walls yet, I was just having a play. They're all gonna come off now while we then smooth in all the landscape. So uh, you'll see me after we've had some fun. Well, I wasn't joking when I said that was a messy process, was I? Now, for me, this messy modeling part is one of my favorites. You're creating something that's totally unique. So if you leave this for a good sort of 10, 15 minutes, just so it starts to go off, um, then go over it with some water, dip your fingers in some water and just go over it and smooth it down um, and try and blend it all in. Mainly because any outrageous little bumps aren't really realistic. Now, you, the, one of the advantages to this is it's um, non-uniform. However, something that's too big wouldn't be realistic. So while it's drying, it's a good place, time to go over it. So one of the other things I've done is I've got some kitchen towel dabbed in water and gone over the back wall there and just cleaned off any bits. Um, once these are dry, these will chip off as well, but it's, while it's wet, you can do quite a lot with it. And finally, one of the more important things, got to make sure our bridges actually still fit. Now, <laughs> I have, dare I say it, already test fit this one before I uh, hit record again uh, because I had to uh, break some of the sculpt mold off and I just used an old fork and uh, there you go it fits nicely so once this dries we'll paint it a base coat of brown so I think it's time we rejoin the journey back on the Festiniog railway where we're racing through the Welsh countryside to Minforth
So you join us as we're climbing higher and higher into our journey as it continues through the stunning Welsh scenery. And I'm still with Tony. <laughs> He's not got off. So, Tony, can you tell me a bit more about the Festiniog Railway itself? Yeah, so the railway was built in 1830 to link the slate quarries in the Blino Festiniog area to the harbour at Port Maddock. It's a journey of roughly 16 miles, which had originally been by a rather treacherous uh, track by horse and cart. A, r a railway would make things a lot smoother. Originally, it was built for, for horse transport. A very clever piece of engineering, actually. It climbs all, all the way we're climbing is at 1 in 80. So the trains would come downhill by gravity and then be towed back up by horses. Uh, gravity trains were supposed to be for, for slate only, but there are some legends of passenger trains also running in this period, which sounds rather precarious. You wouldn't get it today? Definitely not, no. Health and safety would have a field day. <laughs> or at least I hope not. Well, you know, actually, although it sounds quite a precarious way, there's very few recorded accidents from the, the gravity days, and even then, even, no real notes or any fatalities. They obviously knew what they were doing, these guys. You know? So obviously, as we can see, we're not behind a horse anymore, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> thankfully. What led them to move on to steam engines as opposed to horse-drawn wagons? Well, basically, the steam engine was more powerful. Um, a horse could haul roughly eight to ten wagons up the em empty wagons, I should add, that came down loaded, they went up empty, um, up, the, up the 1 in 80 gradient, whereas the steam engine could haul, could haul 40, the first steam engines, that is. Um, they really were the first narrow gauge engines anywhere because at the time many people believed an engine on a steam engine on track that narrow would, would not be successful it'd be unstable it'd fall off basically but um it, they were proved wrong so that the first engines built for the railway were built um, by a company called george england and they're very similar to the engine welsh pony which we've seen in steam uh, they were the first batch were slightly smaller welsh pony is actually a, a large england but they were all built within a short period of time and they were the ones that could haul roughly 40 wagons up the incline. As time went on with the demand for slate booming even the, the, the smaller engines couldn't cope with the, the levels of slate expected to be transported so a solution was needed. Obviously two engines together would be one but that often isn't as economical or productive as you'd think. Uh, one plan was to double the line but the cost of that would have crippled the company because it meant making everything wider and effectively the same width as a standard gauge line. The solution was found in the in the unique double fairly locomotives, which basically is two engines in one and could haul twice a load. In fact, there are reports of double fairlies hauling up to 100 empty wagons back up the way wow. 80 climb. <laughs> it's you know, a massive improvement on eight wagons behind a horse. And I think we can all um, image a steam engine, or what we'd traditionally think as a steam engine, but the double fairlies are absolutely incredible. Yeah. looking things <laughs> it, I mean yeah incredible locos and incredible appearance I mean nothing like that had been seen before what the technology of the articulated bogies of course is commonplace now with diesel locomotives but they were the first ever articulated engines so it must have been absolutely mind blowing to the people who saw them and of course chimney at both ends that's hardly regular <laughs> so just trying to imagine the world back in the 1870s seeing a double fairly for the first time must have been like us seeing a spaceship today. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, they were that revolutionary, and Fairley, who designed them, was a real visionary and had a, a real understanding of, of steam technology. So how did we go from the slate-carrying double Fairleys of the 1870s to what we have up front today, Linda, carrying passengers? Well, actually, Richard, as well as carrying slate in that period, the Festiniog was also the first narrow-gauge railway in the world to carry passengers. In the railway's early days, the carriage of passengers was actually forbidden. It was only the standard gauge lines that were permitted to carry passengers. Although there are tales of uh, passengers kept being carried um, secretly, almost. <laughs> um, rather than paying a fare, they made a donation. Uh, but a, a change in the rules meant that line, narrow gauge lines could carry passengers, and the Festiniog was the first to exploit this. And of course, being in the scenic area we're in, it was very popular with tourists. So as well as being chock-a-block busy with slate traffic, it was also getting a lot of tourist traffic and local traffic on the passenger trains. Really, the late 1800s were the, the boom period for the Festin York Railway. The slate traffic was flowing. You had um, the first standard gauge line coming at Minforth, and you know slate was coming down the valley all the time. Um, but that was it, really. By the time we'd reached the early 20th century, it was it was all over to the slate traffic almost. Well, it wasn't all over, but it was starting to decline. Um, standard gauge tra trains had reached Blino Festiniog standard gauge lines through the London North Western, and really the demand for slate for roofs was starting to fall. 
uh, it didn't help that there were strikes and the Great War, and as all this went on, less and less slate traffic went down the line and more and more tourist traffic. Even then, that started to gradually decline. So really, the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 was the, the death nail of the Festinial Railway, or what we thought was a death nail of the Festinial Railway. It then lay dormant for many years, and an Act of Parliament actually forbid the railway being ripped up and scrapped, which is why it survived dormant for as long as it did, because it was a good ten years before the first preservation plans. By 1955, the first section of the preserve line had been opened, which was basically the length of the cob. Trains ran from Harbour Station to Boston Lodge Works and back in a shuttle system with um, an old World War I simplex diesel and, and Prince, the, um, one of the George England class light Welsh pony, operating those services. And then it was a case of just gradually opening the line further and further. By 1956 they reached Minforth, and by 1958 they reached Tannibalk. In their early days the railway found very soon they needed more locomotives, and a lot of the locomotives at Boston Lodge were, were not fit for service. Around the same time the slate quarries in Penryn were closing, and the locomotives there were available for disposal, which comprised of three larger Hunslets, Linda, Blanche and Charles. Linda and Blanche came to this railway, the first in New York, while Charles remained at Penryn Castle in their museum. Charles remains in original condition where Linda and Blanche were modified for use on the Festiniog. The gauge of the Festiniog is slightly wider than Penryn. Penryn was one foot ten, whereas this is one foot eleven and a half. So in their early days they would they tried to run them on the original gauge and they kept derailing. So they had to be modified with wider gauge and they also fitted them with tenders with more fuel capacity and a bogey wheel at the front to give them the more stability on the tight curves. Whilst Linda was one of the first um, engines to arrive in the preservation era, many more locomotives have either arrived at the railway or been built by the railway to cope with the expanse in traffic. Also a lot more coaches have been built by the railway, although the coaches we're riding in today are historic ones, the railway's actually built some very modern coaches for use on the line, this being down to the phenomenal success of the railway as a heritage railway. So another point of interest on this leg of the journey is as we come into Minforth, on the left is the first standard gauge transfer yard on the Festinog Railway. Originally, the Festinog was the first railway in this part of North Wales. But as time went on, the Cambrian Railway came through Minforth and actually did go on towards Port Maddock. And originally, Festinog trains were down to the harbour for transport by ship, whereas when the Cambrian line came in the 1870s, Festing York built a spur line to link to transfer goods from the narrow gauge trains on standard gauge trains for further distribution around the UK. Ultimately, the best way to experience the scenery and the history of the Festing York Railway is to do exactly what we're doing today take a ride on the train and experience it first hand. So, as we're pulling into Minforth Station, the train will have a short rest here while we wait for Locomotive Blanche to come the opposite way and clear the line for us to continue. This would seem like a very good opportunity to check back the layout back at base. Exactly, and I'm looking forward to the next part of the journey where things become really picturesque. Back to the studio. <laughs> So while we wait for the sculptor mould to dry, it's time to get on and I'm going to paint my uh, Wills Bridge kit here and the cattle culvert. So I'm going to show you how to turn it from the standard plastic kit, as we see here, into hopefully something that looks a bit more realistic in some very easy steps. So I'm being very clever, or trying to be very clever, I've got multiple cameras set up um, so hopefully you'll be able to see me straight on and just over my shoulder you'll be able to see exactly what's in front of me and the bridges so in theory the bridges will be in front of me and behind me massive so i think they look quite good so first things first i'm going to run you through uh, some of the products that i'm using for this project so if i just move these out of the way so the first layer believe it or not i've got a very cheap uh, hobby craft paint and this is beige it's a 60 mil pot 
costs about a pound. Nice and easy. I've also got some Vallejo Madeira wood. I use various Humbrol washes. Um, this is the Humbrol dark green wash. I've also got the Humbrol black wash, which I don't always use, but I will sometimes. And the Humbrol dark grey wash, just there. And then I've also got some Tamiya wooden deck tan. It's XF78 is the number. There we go, right at the front there. So as you can see, a nice selection of paints there. Um, none of which would really lend themselves to stonework. However, hopefully this works and I will uh, show you the process now. So just to one side, I've got my uh, palette here, which as you can see is well used. The first one I'm going to use is the acrylic beige from Hobbycraft. Now this is what I'll use for the undercoat for the whole thing. So I'm going to cover all the plastic work in this bar, the underneath, which we'll tackle later. So I'm just going to pour a bit on my palette here. And using an old brush, I'm just going to cover all the surfaces in this acrylic paint. There we go. So one tip I was always taught that if you want to create the feel of a, the same area on a layout, that if you do your painting in the same style and if you can do it all together um, for the various structures, it will have the feel, as we can see here, that it's from the same area, same sort of the stoneworks from the same quarry or the slates from the same slate mine, etc. So that's one tip, and that's why I like to paint all my sort of stonework, particularly on this uh, build, together because I want it to have that same vibe. So I'm now going to let this dry. The next stage is quite extreme. You're probably not going to believe what I'm going to do to it or how I can recover it to look anything like a uh, stone-sided bridge. So hopefully this dries quickly. Right, so the beige undercoat is now dry and I'm now about to spoil it all. I'm grabbing my um, Vallejo Madeira wood paint, as you can see there. So taking a small brush here, I'm just going to make zebra stripes on the stonework. Now, while that is still wet, I'm going to take my new best friend, which is a cotton bud, and just rub in all the wet paintwork. Doesn't want to be everywhere, but it wants to be in most places. As you can see, that's starting to rub in now. What that does, it gives you a, a random pattern, which as it dries, will form a very nice undercoat and give you just those little, little hints of color later on. So I'm now gonna do the, the main bridge here. And I'll see you when that's all striped. there we go, we're left with orange zebra stripes. So same as before, I'm gonna let this dry now and then uh, we'll get on with the next stage. So I think enough time has passed that the cattle grid here has dried and ready for the next phase. And by the time I finish that, the bridge will be fixed and ready. So I'm moving on to use my uh, Humbrol dark green wash, which I've had for some time. Now we've all got old bottles of paint and things around. This is no different, although it has been left in the sun a bit too long. As you can see, there's no liquid in it anymore. However, I put a bit of enamel thinner in it to revive it, and it comes up as a lovely paste on the end of an earbud. So what I'm going to do is take my cattle grid, and rather than throw this away, I'm actually going to do the same again, but with the green wash, or what's left of it. Of course, you can use uh, normal paints as well if you have those. I'm trying to be a bit thrifty with this project just to show you don't need to go out and uh, spend a fortune on these things. And same again we're just doing zebra stripes on it. I 
You'll notice as well we're starting with the lighter colours first and then the dark, moving on to the darker ones. That tends to be because you have less of the darker colours than you do the lighter ones. So you can really build this up, really experiment with it. And to be honest, you can have some, quite some fun with it. Worst case, if you get it all wrong, let it dry, paint it back over again with the beige paint. There we go, two camouflaged bridge sides. <laughs> As you can see, it's um, hard to imagine how that can turn into this, but I will show you in one very easy step how we're gonna do it on the next phase. So as before, we're gonna let these dry and then we'll come back and I'll show you the next. So I think enough time has passed and it's time to make this look like something to be proud of. Right, the next product I'm going to be using is my humble dark grey wash. Now, again, it's been sat in the drawer, so I'm just going to give it a shake. The first step, taking a, uh, a brush with the wet wash and quite simply painting over the whole bridge sides. So with these, you do want to take, cover it in paint, lather it up, then also in the same breath, make sure there's no real excess on the bridge sides at all, ready for this next stage. So as the uh, grey wash there, which looks like I've just painted it in into a grey stone colour, is drying, I'm now going to take the Humbrol enamel thinners, because I want to take the bulk of it off, and the way I do this is I grab cotton buds, and you will go through a lot of these for this process, and you simply wipe the paint off. And what I tend to do is use one of the heads of the cotton bud around the end, and then after you've got a small section done, like so, switch it round to the dry end, and take a bit more off. And now I'm going to proceed and uh, do that for the rest of it. You can see there how taking half of it back off, it's starting to look quite effective. Now, when that dries properly, because you will leave this once it's done to dry uh, properly overnight, um, it looks very effective, and then we can do some final touches. So I'm gonna finish up with this now, and uh, take the rest of the gray wash off, and uh, we'll see how it looks tomorrow morning. So the next stage, now we've got our basic brickwork, I'm going to take more cotton buds, as you can see, and I'm going to use this time the uh, Tamiya Wooden Deck Tam, which is XF78, that one right there. And all I'm going to do with this one is cotton bud in there. And I want to take, again, most of the paint off. So I'm dabbing it on my piece of paper until the bulk of it's gone. Because what I'm going to do is highlight, same again, dab all the flagstones just to highlight them ever so slightly. So all that's left to do now is to put the bridges on the layout and hopefully that starts to set the scene. As you can see the highlighted stones work really well, very subtle, but just enough just to bring out some of the details. You could go on and add all sorts of weathering colours and tones to this to really blend it into the scene. It's probably something I'll do a bit later on. So the last thing I'm going to do in this episode is paint the sculptor mold brown with some 
Woodland Scenics Earth Undercoat. In the next episode, I'll show you how I ballast the track and paint the track with a realistic finish without the need of an airbrush. I'll also show you how I align the track between the first baseboard and the second one, and we start the all important scenery. So I think it's time we rejoined myself and Tony on the Festiniog Railway, where we're waiting at Minfold Station to see what's coming in the next episode, further on on the line. But before that, let's join Mike with this month's new additions. My name's Jonathan Taylor, I'm the manager of Govan Loco. It's in Wakefield, West Yorkshire. We sell Batman, Hornby, Pico, Dapple, Oxford Rail, Airfix, you name it, pretty much everything. We pride ourselves on our rare pieces that we get in from time to time. Govan Loco is a large store featuring various rooms of stock. It has a large car park, uh, which is free and we are not far away from Outward Railway Station as well. They can email us via goinglocomodels at hotmail.com. You can also call us on 01924 824 748. Our website is www.goinglocomodels.com. Hello and welcome back to Topley Dale for the new arrival section of the Hornby Magazine Show. As you can see on the layout today, we've got a lot of new models to talk about, covering double O gauge, N gauge, and O gauge as well. We start with a brand new arrival from Hornby. They've got their new A22462s out, and they're modelling 60501 Cock of the North and 60505 Thane of Fife. Both are finished in British Railways line green liveries, with 60501 featuring an early crest and 60505 a late crest. These new Pacifics have been a hot topic of discussion lately, as there have been a couple of issues with their assembly. Hornby's aware of the problems and we're looking forward to getting an update from them soon, which will include in the next issue of Hornby magazine. We've also got new samples from Hatton's on the railway today, with the decorated samples of their Genesis 4 and 6 wheel coaches. Now we've already seen the undecorated samples, the engineering samples, and now they've progressed quite quickly to the livery stage as well. Our samples are finished in Great Western Railway chocolates and cream, and they feature a high level of detail both for the exterior finish and the interior detailing as well. One of the things I really like about these coaches actually is the internal luggage racks, which look superb inside the coaches. It's quite easy access to those as well. The roofs just unclip from the bodies, giving you easy access to add your own passengers, or if you just want a little sneak peek at what's inside. Naturally, we'll be looking at those in more detail once those models are complete and ready for us to review in full in Hornby magazine. Also in double O gauge, we've got a Backman Fowler 7F 280 on the layout. It's not a new item, but it is part of our Somerset and Dorset celebration theme from issue 166. Now, what we've done is we've installed a U-Choose 21 pin sound decoder, it's a Zimo sound decoder, into this locomotive together with Stay Alive and the speaker. We've also added a Model U crew too. And there's a full step-by-step -step guide for that in the latest issue of Hornby Magazine. Plus, if you're joining us online, you can see a full video of the sound demonstration for that on Key Model World right now. And next week, there's more 7F stuff as well. We've got a weathering demonstration for this locomotive as well, rounding off the complete picture for that locomotive. Moving up to something a little bit more modern, we've also got a pair of Class 68s. Uh, one of those is Richard's latest addition to his own collection, which is 68023 Achilles in Transpennine colours, a standout livery for me in terms of modern traction locomotives. Plus, we've also got a direct rail services livery version finished as 68008 Avenger. Now, Avenger is here because it's got a brand new sound file in it installed by Digitrains, and that's on the Zimo platform again. 
The sound file has been produced by John Gay and replicates all the functionality of the real locomotives from the startup procedure to running sounds, horns and ancillary functions too. We've got a full review of that again in the latest issue of the magazine together with a full sound demonstration available to watch right now on keymodworld.com. I'm going to continue mentioning the website because we've got loads more things to come there too as well and that really is the first place to see all our latest video content when it comes to these new models. Now moving up a scale we go up to O-Gage and on the layout we've got the Class 17 from Helgen which again full video it's even been out running in the garden it was a little bit cold feel at filming that part but great fun still to see that locomotive out and running on the garden railway with a nice long good strain behind it too. That model is now available and in four different liveries so it's available in BR green with small yellow warning panels. BR green with full yellow warning ends, BR blue with full yellow ends, and BR green with small yellow warning panel and a weathered finish numbered as D8607. Again, you can read our full review in the latest issue. Also new from Helgen for O-Gage is the GWR AEC railcar, another striking addition to the Helgen O-Gage portfolio. Our sample model is W20W in BR carmine and cream livery with white cab roofs and a black main roof. And we've been enjoying putting that through its paces here on our test tracks too, both indoors and again, braving the cold outside. Completing the O-Gage lineup is Hatton's Gresley Corridor Coaches. We've had a little collection of five of these come into the office so we can show a full rake running here on our test track. On the layout today, we've got one of the brake corridor composite examples, but they're also open third and third corridor coaches too. They're available now in both BR Maroon and BR Carmine and Cream liveries with Ernie R Varnish Teak still to come. Moving down to Engage, we've got a pair of new releases for the scale too. Now, first of those is the EFE Rail Shark Ballast Plough. Now, this is the latest product from the EFE Rail brand, which has been supplied by Backman, and it's a really nice addition to the collection of wagons there. The shark was always found at the end or the middle of ballast trains, and they were used to plough ballast as it was dropped from the hopper wagons. It's a lovely little detail model, and it's also been joined by another wagon for the Engage portfolio, in the Graham Farish LMS Parrot. This flat wagon is another nice addition, which could allow a bit of expansion of your goods trains, particularly for the steam era period before 1948. Now, as I said, all these models, they're featured in full in the latest issue of Hornby Magazine, that's issue 166, the April 2021 issue, and you can see the cover here. Plus, if you're looking to see our latest video content on these locomotives and items of rolling stock, you can hop over to keymodelworld.com and you can find free videos there, as well as if you're a subscriber, you can also log in and find more features and videos behind the paywall too. That's all for the new arrivals this month, so I'm going to hand you back to Richard and the Festinia Railway. I'm uh, Adam Davis of uh, Rails of Sheffield Limited. We're a family run business, we've been trading for over 50 years now. We've also been voted Retailer of the Year for the last two years running. We sell any age, any gauge, tens of thousands of items for all man major manufacturers, continental, American, from you know your N-gauge, Z-gauge, right up to live steam, right on. We do many in-house exclusives, uh, all available on our website, railsofsheffield.com. The address here is 21 to 29 Chesterfield Road, Sheffield, SA0RL. So Blanche is passing and we're about to depart Minford Station. So Tony, what can we expect next time on building the Festiniog? Well Richard, we'll continue our journey on the Festiniog Railway towards Tannibalk. As we climb up the 180 gradient, we'll see more of the scenery the Festiniog is renowned for and see some more of the elements required to build a 009 gauge model railway. We'll also take a look first hand at the industry that inspired the Festiniog Railway. Well I for one am very excited about the next episode. For now, I'll say thank you very much for watching. If you want to see more, don't forget to click that subscribe button. And you can read part one of the build process right now in Hornby Magazine issue 166. That's the April 2021 edition. Thanks for watching. See you next time.
glyfer Slipfer o'ch o'n arwrys Dia man, rwy'n mynd i drysu ar y dre O'r mynd i gael ffenestri Mae dŵr yw ben y llestri Ac mae'r celf i gyd yn daclus yn ei dde